Tours as we celebrate the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Our liturgy of the Holy Eucharist Rite 2 begins on page, continues on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time, grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hear what the Lord said. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear your mountain, the 
controversy of the Lord and your enduring foundation of the earth. For the Lord has controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I have brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember how what King Balak and Moab of Moab devised and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. And what happened to Shethegum and Galilee, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and how myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, with, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from 1 Corinthians. A message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, mm. but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Mm. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, St. Martins. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Have you ever felt confused about images of God from the Bible? Sometimes God is like a good shepherd carrying us on his shoulders when we are lost or hurt. And sometimes there are passages like the one from Micah today where it seems like maybe God is a really angry parent who might also be a little bit crazy. In today's lesson from the prophet Micah, Micah narrates a hypothetical dialogue between God and the people of Israel where God is saying, Israel, what is your deal? Come out here and tell me to my face what it is I have done to you mm -hmm. for me to deserve for you to treat me this way. Mm -hmm. How have I wearied you? What is it that I asked that stressed you out so much that you behave like this? Answer me! Mm -hmm. I saved you on this when you messed up. I gave you really nice stuff. I know I let you have a party with your friends. Do you remember any of that right now? And now you want to know what you should do to make me happy. Hmm. Now you want to be sorry. Now you want to do your chores. Now you want to try and get on my good side. Maybe you should have thought about that before. Hmm. As you can tell, that was no translation of anything of the Bible, but it was an amplification of that portion. But don't you think the actual passage has that ring to it? Yep. God's part is clearly angry and kind of sarcastic. Doesn't it sound a little bit like Ray Romano as Everybody Likes Raymond, or John Goodman as Dan Connor and Roseanne, or a little more recent, because I haven't watched any sitcoms since obviously a long time ago, but Adrian Holmes as Philip Banks in Bel Air? Hmm. All good sitcom dads prone to impulsive speech and tantrums. <clears throat> Why would Micah portray God as like a father from a sitcom who confuses everyone by alternately ranting and raving and then inviting you to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. We know from psychology that mixed messages from a parent or anyone do not lead to trust. Mixed messages make us anxious, wary, and unlikely to rely on someone. And that is inconsistent with what we know of the nature of our loving creator God to send mixed messages. But why do the writings of the prophets make it look like God does that? Micah is one of the handful of prophets from an era then when Israel was dealing with one oppressive empire after another. Living in slavery, being in exile, being under heavy oppression over the expression of their faith. Micah's prophecies are believed to be during the period of the Assyrian domination, known for having been especially brutal. In my recent course in Hebrew scriptures, yes, you'll be hearing about seminary for a long time, folks, sorry. <laughs> We focus on how trauma that the people we focus on how trauma that the people of Israel experienced during this period shaped the writings of the Hebrew Scriptures and their images of God that they understood. Judith Herman, a psychologist who writes as an expert on trauma, tells us traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning. And that's what the people of Israel were really looking for, is that regaining of some sense of control or connection and meaning. Have you ever wondered why it seems like the God of the Hebrew Scriptures can't decide whether to be really angry or really merciful? Has it ever made you nervous about your own image of God and what God really is like? 
Have you ever read a passage like that, like the passage, and been unsure what you can or cannot pray or trust about God? Back to looking at how trauma impacted the writings of the prophets for a minute. The people of Israel had all these empires after them. They had famine, they had drought and plagues and pestilences and floods and all manner of grumpy neighbors. And it was scary for them to wonder why God didn't stop them from having these problems. In the absence of modern science about weather, agriculture, and medicine, there were correlations that became causations. When it came to explaining the catastrophic events, the people were desperate for understanding. Those that have studied the history of the people of Israel from a trauma perspective, David Carr being one of the most well-known, have hypothesized that the prophets were doing what many of us try to do, to explain why bad stuff happens to good people. Mm -hmm. Judaism, in 800 BCE, taught that God was in control. Everything that happened was predestined. God already had it planned, and God caused it. That meant that every bad thing that happened had to be attributed to God and God's wrath or attitude. And since God's wrath had to be seen as just, otherwise that would make a, a bad God, then that wrath had to be traced back to people's bad behavior. So be it in a sitcom or in a dysfunctional family, this plot is known as Dad is only mad because we've been bad. There is no need to make that parent reference gendered other than it rhymes. So mom or dad is only mad because we were bad. Hmm. The prophets were faced with explaining to the people why these imperial powers surrounding them kept winning, killing them and why they ended up enslaved or exiled or living under these very oppressive rules. In addition, they had to explain why if God was in charge and planned everything, that sometimes the weather was bad, and sometimes the animals got sick and died, and sometimes mothers died in childbirth, and when the crops failed, bunches of people starved. When the premise for the people of Israel was that God was in control of everything, but bad stuff was still happening, there were really only two options left. Yeah, that's the problem. Either it was God's fault, a rare accusation, but something that is illustrated in some of the laments of the prophets, or the much more common option, it is our fault. This is the basis of what theologians call moral act consequence theory. It plays out like this. God let the Assyrians conquer us because we had been offering sacrifices to idols and didn't didn't deserve God's protection. There was no doubt enough bad human behavior that it wasn't hard for the prophets to find something or someone to blame for adversity. We do stupid stuff. We do harmful stuff. Mm -hmm. Actions do have consequences. Yes, they do. That's not the thing we're questioning. But that is different than saying that every bad thing is a consequence sent by God mm -hmm. and that it was caused by our behavior. Mm -hmm. Those are two separate ideas. Human nature hasn't changed that much. Most of us are more comfortable with a reason that bad things happen. We want to believe that God protects us when we are good and might send or allow bad things to visit us when we are bad, like small bad things. It makes us feel more secure than thinking that we can be doing our very best to be good and still have a tornado hit our home mm -hmm. or a child killed in a mass shooting at the grocery store or at our synagogue. Mm -hmm. We desperately want things to make sense. For those who have watched the coverage about the death of Tyree Nichols, the most common reaction I have heard after just utter horror mm -hmm. has been the exclamation of, why, why? How could a traffic stop lead to someone's death? Why? This makes no sense. We think we would feel safer if there was some way to make sense of why. For the people of Israel, they wanted the safe feeling that God causes everything, but they did not anticipate 
how that would be inconsistent with their experience of traumatic events. Like the people of Israel, sometimes we have a collection of beliefs and we haven't mm, taken them out and looked at how they do or don't fit together. As Christians, most of us believe that God intentionally created us with free will so that we could be unique and creative and love God voluntarily. God could have made robots, but we know that robots can't be human. They can't love, they can't adore, they can't fail, they can't surprise or disappoint. They don't betray, and they can't exceed all imagined expectations. We, in general, are pretty proud that we are not robots. In general. So most of us agree that we were created with free will. And most of us, if we've read the news or seen anything lately on TV, would also agree that humans misuse that free will to harm one another individually and systemically every day. Yes, ma'am. Like the people of Israel, there is little agreement, less agreement, about the question about whether God is in control of everything. Hmm. Not many Episcopalians believe in predestination of everything, but many of us still have those little pockets of predestination of some things sprinkled in. Well, we sprinkled. We may joke about getting a parking place being arranged by God. That's hmm. on the mild end. Hmm moderate zone that's pretty functional is you know we hope that we get some sort of guidance from God on taking a job or making a big move or a large purchase and the not so functional zone we might suggest to someone that the death of their loved one must be because it was in God's timing mm. I hate mm. that one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or as Jerry Falwell did decide that the entire disaster of Hurricane Katrina was caused by Ellen DeGeneres being from New Orleans and being gay. Mm. I hate that one too. Mm. There were televangelists who said 9-11 was a judgment from God about the state of Christianity in the United States. Handy, that predestination thing. Mm. What about us? What do we believe is planned by God in our life ahead of time? And what do we believe about our choices in the matter and our free will? Believing we have free will and believing that everything happens, that everything that happens is controlled by God, those are incompatible. Unless you want that vague feeling of unease about the nature of God, or to have a really confusing Christian witness when you share with others why you are a Christian. One of those beliefs has to go. Assuming we want to keep the free will part because we really like that part that we're not robots. That means we are faced with the less comforting thought that God is not in control of everything. Now, God is present in everything across all types of circumstances. And God stays in relationship with us in everything. And even if we have engaged in unjust or unwise actions... There will be consequences, but God will be with us and love us there too. But when we are faced with loss or tragedy, our task is not to assume God sent it. Not to blame God for not preventing it. Not to blame our neighbor. Not to blame our enemy. Or even blame ourselves. Our job is to seek to cope and move forward with God's presence and love no matter how slowly. Mm. Mm. God's nature is stable. God loves us no matter what mm -hmm. and is not fickle or unreliable. Mm -hmm. The words of the prophet Micah are true. What does God require of us? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. Yay, St. Martin's. That is God's exhortation to us. But it is not a contractual obligation for us to earn God's love. God's love is only available to us by God's free will. Mm. There is no contractual agreement mm. that would control that ever. Neither is there any failure of a contractual obligation on our part that would cause God to send us adversity. Mm. That is not the nature of our loving God. Mm. Amen. Amen. Amen.
when you're ready and if you're able, I invite you to stand and join in the Nicene Creed, page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people today are form three found on page 387 of your prayer book. As we pray for those on our prayer list, you are invited to join in these prayers. The prayer list can be found on the back of your bulletin. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of Pakistan. Remembering those on the di diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Trinity, Trinity Bay, Bay City and St. John the Apostle of Ionia. In St. Martin's cycle of prayer, we pray for Nancy, Nancy Logan, Logan, Pat, Miley, Barb, and Kathy. Loving God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. For Julianne and all others who discern vocations to ordain or lay ministry, and for all those seeking a deeper knowledge of God, grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray, pray for Michael, our presiding <coughs> bishop, for Prince, our bishop, for Reginald, for Bonnie, Rayford, and Moses, the bishops of our companion diocese for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and for Craig, the Bishop of this area of Synod of the ELCA. We pray for the diocesan canon commissioner, Alan, Val, and Anne, and for the clergy associated with this parish, Mary, Pat, Rick, and Mike. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Joseph, our president, and Gretchen, our governor, for our Congress and our courts, that together with all people we may rise above partisanship and strive to serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. We pray for Peace House, serving families and church and children in the East Side neighborhood with after school tutoring, mentoring, food assistance, and outdoor play space for youth, with an emphasis on peace and justice in their community and the world. 
Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That, that our works may find favor in your sight. We pray for all those who have been victims of human trafficking as we recognize Slavery and Human Traffic Trafficking Prevention Month. We are grateful for the efforts of our friends in the Diocese of Durgapur, India, who work to prevent human trafficking and provide trafficking awareness among the villagers. We pray for those who have lost their lives to gun violence and for all friends and family members who live with that trauma. We pray for Tyree Nichols' family, the Memphis community, this nation, and the world. We pray for those on our prayer list. Alan, Alan Delia, Jenny, Joel, Lori, and Patty, Lori, Kayla, Monica, Frank, Christopher, Julia, Karen, Sean, Jeannie, Tony, Christopher, Jeannie, Curtis, Kate, recently diagnosed with breast cancer who have asked for our prayers. Can you hear Patricia, Patricia, Tamara, Sean, Bonnie, Judy, Karen, Hannah, Sandra, Stacy, Shirley, Alice, Robin, Katie, Jordan, Michelle, Jean, Faith, Annette, Randy, Margaret, Lily, and Joanne. We ask your prayers for those who have no one to pray for them and for those we now name. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let a light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. <clears throat> O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Continuing on page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
How shall we respond to God's great love? We shall love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our minds, and with all our strength. And we shall love our neighbors as ourselves. And in honor of Julianne's sermon, what does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen.
gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, mm -hmm. to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever.
people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ loves you mm. and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Amen.
we stand for the post communion prayer on page 366. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, set us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated unless you're celebrating a birthday or anniversary and would like to come forward for prayer and a blessing. Are there any announcements for the good of the body? <laughs> I'll make some. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. So we have this wonderful opportunity coming to us uh, next month because there's this rumor that it's Black History Month, right? Yeah. And some folks wondered if we could teach the children and maybe some not so young at heart people, some movement music, music from uh, you know the civil rights time. So somebody asked me if I would make a recording or several, and somebody else put them up on our Facebook page. Is that where it is? Or YouTube, YouTube. page? On our YouTube page. It's also on our Facebook page for parishioners only. Okay, see, I don't know the, all the information. It's also on our Facebook, internal Facebook page for members only. And so you can learn four, five, six, four right now. Uh, songs. Ain't gonna lie, nobody turn me around. Yeah, that one. Woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Okay, that one. Some people are asking for clapping in church, so we'll work on, you know, timed or untimed clapping. Uh, there's a joke in there, but I'm not gonna say it from right here. And um, uh, let's see, we'll learn a tune that I actually learned in Africa, which is basically God is so good, but it's in Kiswahili. No, it's in Rwanda, Kiwaranda. And um, the old standby, we shall overcome. So now, you know that there's like three, four, five children in church, and some of them are a little shy. And they don't want to come up front. So we'll sing from back there somewhere, and we would invite you all to sing with us. The words, that, all the songs that we're doing, we will have the words printed too because they're fit in our licensing thing, right? So you all can have the ones that we, we're working on. That's one thing. Thank you very much. Our anti-racism announcement for today is um, we just finished uh, six days of training uh, the Michigan Child Support Anti-Racism Transformation Team. And I will confess to you, it was, um, it may have been one of the hardest trainings of my career. And, um, a number of reasons for that, but um, not the least of which is, you know, all the stuff in the, in the news about Tyree and his family and, you know. So um, we're grateful, because I know some of you have been praying. You asked me about them on the weekly. And uh, I want you to know it's done. It was done well. They, they, they got where they needed to go. And um, we have some more work to do with them. And I'll continue to report in as necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today is our annual meeting. We will, oh, we are ahead of schedule. So um, we, have, we have people who will be coming in by Zoom. You're laughing at me. 
available for us. It's all individually packaged because of COVID, so we should be safe. You are welcome to eat the food. There's not any? Cookies are out, and they're not individually packaged. Oh, well, um, individual cookies. That's, just, that's how much I know. So two there are two. treats. Two for two. Two for two, two, two. yes. <laughs> Okay, what do I know to be true? I know that we will. There will be an annual meeting. <laughs> there will be an annual meeting. Uh, Sam is going to set up Zoom for us. And that will open at 11.30, but we've said the meeting would start uh, at the earliest at 11.45, so that's what we will shoot for. I need probably nine chairs or so up in front. These up here can be used, that might be the easiest uh, for the vestry. What else do you need to know? Oh, thank you to whoever moved the chairs because they weren't moved this way on Friday. That would be Julianne and Mary. Nice. Oh, mm. well, thank you to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Julianne the did the hard work. Okay. Well, she's in seminary. She should be. <laughs> That's one of the things that happens in cemetery. The hard thing is actually where they go, and Mary's got an eye for that. I just look and go, tell them where they go. I don't know where they go. Yes, the chairs will be slanted like this until Lent, when they will go back to straight. Is there anything about the two video things in terms of when people are watching those? Or oh, yes. We have created two video things. Did you get it to play up here um, or no? We haven't done that one yet. The one on the TV okay. is set and then for meantime or before we'll get Eric, to if you can help us maybe get get something um, projected onto the screen, that would be great. We have prepared two things and we hope that you will see both of them. One is already showing on the TV in the parish hall. It's photographs through the year of 2022. We will have that going before and after the meeting in here if we can. And then during the meeting we have the short videos from 2022 that we will play in here. Um, that was one of the highlights of the year for me so thank you for <laughs> thank you for doing them and for not leaving while they're on. You won't. Please stand for the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace and give you joy. The Lord's blessing be upon you. I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.